Steve Berriman will celebrate his 70th birthday this winter. He doesn't look a year over 40. Yeah. Steve was given his senior debut for Tottenham as an 18-year-old in Jimmy Greaves last season with the club. At the final count, as the club's longest-serving player, he made 866 appearances for the Lily Whites before spells at Oxford and Brentford. Steve would then manage both Brentford and Watford for three seasons and then coached in Norway and Japan before spending 13 years as director of football at Ex Exeter City. He was a Football Writers Association's Football of the Year in 1982. I'm John Richardson. And I'm Neil Harmon. I first met Steve Perryman, and he remembers, I'm sure, in my local pub in Hockley, Essex, with our fraternal chum, the ex End and Spurs winger Peter Taylor, in the mid-1970s, and I've followed his career closely ever since. Steve, it's, it's great to have you with us here on the Old Spice Boys podcast, but it's kind of sad to reflect that in the space of the last 10 days, we've lost a pair of wonderful strikers who were involved in the England World Cup 1966 winning squad. Jimmy Greaves, your old mucker, and uh, and, and Roger Hunt. Um, in '66, I, I'm guessing you were an apprentice at Spurs, and I wonder what you recall of those kind of formative developing years for you as a pro, young pro. I joined in '67. I joined Tottenham after they won the cup against Chelsea. By the way, it's a pleasure to be on your podcast and and say hello to you both again. Um, so. Uh, I mean, the game sort of changed because of that 66 World Cup victory. Um, wingers started to be taken out because they were seen as lazy. You needed wide midfield players who could run up and down, do the job of a winger, but were more solid. And yeah, wing, wingers were looked upon as a as a as, as a, a breed that was being lost to the game as such. You know, the Terry Paynes of the world and. Ian Callaghan's and those sort of players. So, uh, which really had been the, the the norm for English football for some years. You know, English crowds have been turned on by wingers getting the ball and running at their fullback and attempting to beat them and getting crosses in. So, so that 66 sort of did change everything and it became, the game became more systemised. And I suppose in a way, when, when players were being judged on how much work they did and and how much effort they put in. The Jimmy Greaves sort of era was coming to a close as well because, you know, there, there were voices saying, you know, if Jimmy doesn't score, he doesn't add a lot else. And we all know that the goal scoring bit is the, is the hardest thing to do in, in, in football of whatever era. So, um, so I suppose we're talking about two great men, two great players with certainly different characters as such. Not that I knew Roger Hunt really well, but I must have played against him probably four or five, six times. And Roger was the, although he was, a, they both goal scorers and got fantastic records. Uh, Roger was more the consistent runner worker. Whereas Jimmy was, could he be called a luxury player? And then eventually, you know, didn't play in the final. And Roger did, of course. So, um, and we all know what happened then with the Jeff Hurst hat trick and great, great times for us all. But it really was a sort of changing situation. You know, people follow winners. And and Ramsey did it without wingers. And therefore, the new role of a midfield player was to be run around, be energetic, put your foot into tackles, you know, be a be a Nobby Styles. Um, if that's what Lucas thought, that's all he did. Well, I think he did more than that. But um, yeah, so it was uh, it was a good time to be involved with football. The characters were great, and I certainly know more about Jimmy's character than Roger <laughs> Hunt. But I found out some nice stuff about him, and if th therefore we can discuss further, of course. And you at that stage, were, were you a defender or a midfield player or were you an amalgam of both? Uh, well, I was an inside forward. You were an inside <laughs> forward? Okay, so you started... You, you inside forward. But gradually, that, gradually that, got... But that gets turned into a midfield player. Yeah. And being a, an inside forward rather than a wing half, uh, my schoolboy game, for instance, England internationals and, and for London and Middlesex and all that... 
I was a purveyor of the ball. I was a, a server to the to the wingers, to the front men, to the to the chance takers. So um, I suppose that over the course of I, when I joined Tottenham, my first ever pre-season as a 15 year old from school, I actually joined them with a broken bone in my hand through playing over the park with my brothers and my mates. And I went down on the ground badly. And so it was all strapped up. So I was told almost in the sort of new midfielders way of doing things that I wasn't allowed to take part in games, for instance, 11 v 11s, but I was told to chase the ball. And remember, this is a football club I'm playing for. This is Bill Nicholson's Tottenham Hotspur who could, who could play. Yeah. So, um, I, th I think that was an indication on how my game was going to be looked upon, not as an inside forward, but as a, a working midfielder. And no one was afforded the luxury of being the number 10. Right. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> like today, the number 10. Wow. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, you know, I, I've seen squads that, these days that have got five number 10s and haven't got a, number, a centre forward. So I don't quite know how that works. <laughs> <laughs> Steve, can you give us a, a little bit of an insight into Bill Nicholson? Obviously, one of the managerial greats, but for the modern generation, they probably won't know too much about him. I mean, uh, you know, he yeah. was the sort of architect of the modern Spurs, I suppose, in, in many respects. Very much so. He, um, terrific man. Um, I had this talk with one of his two daughters, and we both agreed her as a daughter, me as a young player coming into the game, fresh, that we didn't want to let this type of man down. Mm -hmm. he, he, he wasn't, he wasn't uh, a bully type, but he, he found it very difficult to give you praise. Mm -hmm. I think that's maybe a Yorkshire trait. I don't know, but, um, he you certainly don't like giving you money. That, well, that as well. I, I was coming on to that. <laughs> he, he thought that for you to have the honour of putting that white shirt on, that you should pay them. And I did say to him one day when I got a bit bit braver, Bill, but <laughs> don't pay the mortgage, does it? And I also said to him one day, but Bill, you know, a pair of shoes cost you 15 quid these days. And he said, not where I buy them from. <laughs> so I, I tell people this story about Bill Nicholson on a Monday morning walking into the treatment room. Four beds. If you've got four beds, they're full. <laughs> if you've got three, they're full. So, I mean, there's, there's something against, there's something for having one bed. <laughs> anyway, in those days, we had five teams playing on a Saturday, on a weekend. Under 17s, under 18s, A team, reserves, first team. So you can imagine with 50 or 60 players involved, on a Monday morning, there was three fat ankles, two cut eyes, <laughs> three bad backs, etc. And you either got a bed, and if you were the youngest, you didn't get a bed, or you had to stand in the corner and, and wait there. So Bill Nick would walk in, immaculate. Not not um, not in a fashionable way, but you know the the creases on his trousers were mm. were right down the middle. They were proper, and his hairline, his his parting was was perfect. And he'd walk in, and this is what he would do. <laughs> <laughs> not good for podcasts. <laughs> For those who can't see Steve, and, he's just uh, he's just looking around the room, effectively. And yeah. basically, so his eyes went from one bed to the next, no comment, and eventually a big sigh, and walk out. <laughs> no, how are you? Now, no, are you improving? Not, how did you get that? Etc. And basically, what he was saying is, and I've heard similar things about Liverpool's. Yeah, Bill Shankly. Yeah. yeah, Bill Shankly. Was that I've got to go and deal with the people that can get me the next result. Mm. And I don't think you lot are going to get me the next result. <laughs> <laughs> it was a it was a cruel type of kindness mm. and a discipline. And 
you you had to want to play for Bill Nick to select you. I mean, that sounds strange as if some people don't want to play, yeah. but some some people haven't worked out their game yet and don't know how to get selectable, especially the sort of flair players. They they sometimes have this opinion, well, my flair is enough to get me through. And that wasn't good enough for Bill. And I always remember a story told by Ralph Coates. We, we went and played an end-of-season game, last game against Stoke City away. And Bill Nicholson went, not that we knew, but he went to sign Ralph Coates on a motorway service area. Eddie Bailey went in another direction to look at somebody. And we were left, the first team, and we were left with Johnny Wallace, the kit man, who gave the meeting and told us the team. And we all thought that this was Bill Nick's way of maybe not. If we'd have, if we'd have won that game, we finished third and you get position money. So we think maybe Bill, on one occasion only in the world, <laughs> was he not too happy with us winning the game. <laughs> so... Anyway, we did. But the point of the story is, Ralph says, he sat in the car with Bill Nick, he signed the forms, and Bill Nick says, so Ralph, how does it feel being a Tottenham Hotspur player? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, great. Great, Bill. No, how does it feel in here to be a Tottenham Hotspur player? Ralph said, Steve, there was no words, there was no actions that I could actually give to satisfy him, <laughs> to let him know that I really wanted to be a Tottenham Hotspur player. So love for his club. Uh, he wanted you to give of your best all the time. He wanted you to, he, he, in a way, we all got treated the same. I, I didn't ever see him treating Jimmy Greaves different to Steve Perriman, mm. 28, 15, 16. Um, I suppose there must have been times when that was was apparent, but I think he was a very fair man, but hard with it. And uh, but they came up for a tough school, didn't they? Him and Eddie Bailey. And yeah. now Bill Nick, Bill Nick won the league with the 50-51 team, and he won the league again as a manager. So one as a player, one as a manager, and there's not too many people done that. So his knowledge of football, his reading, he's he's. His way of putting it across was such that uh, it could be that I'm I'm watching too much of that dancing program. Um, what's it called? <laughs> On Strictly come, down, come dancing. But the fundamentals, <laughs> <laughs> fundamentals he gave you through his teaching every day was just gold dust. Gold. So dust. You, you'd give him a ten, then, Steve? Would you? I'd give him a ten. Um, in terms of getting the best out of my type of character. Yeah. I think if you were another type of character, you might have struggled with him. I listened to his every word. I didn't want to let him down, as I spoke about earlier. And uh, I was prepared to give my all for that club and that team. And if you were that, you stood a good chance of being selected by Bill Nicholson. I know this is a difficult question, Steve, but do you think there's a modern equivalent? Can you relate to anybody now in, in the game managing or maybe in the past few years? Um, I mean, there's Alex Ferguson, obviously. Alex, yeah. Um, I, I I very much like the look of the, uh, I can't believe I've forgotten his name, the, the yeah. Sheffield United man who's who's now gone elsewhere. Um, oh, Chris, Chris Wilder. Chris, Chris, Chris Wilder. Wilder. I, yeah. I really liked his his style and his his yeah. manner on television after a performance, and um, uh, yeah, I, I, it's a different world, isn't it? I, yeah, yeah. I saw the. I know we're going to come on to this later, but I saw Tuchel's about his third game, yeah. and he put Hudson Odoi on. And then 20 minutes later, took him off. Mm. And quite rightly, the match, the chap interviewing at the end of the game, asked the question, why did you put him on and then take him off? Tuchel said, didn't like his body language, didn't like this, didn't like that. Very matter of fact, but no, no, 
No more harsher criticism than that, other than there was some stuff he didn't like. So they go back to the studio and they say to a man, three non-managers, Gary Lineker, probably Alan Shearer and another, oh, you can't manage like that. Oh, no, you can't manage like that. And I think, OK, I'm going to listen to your goal scoring exploits. I'm going to listen to you. You've got to get yeah. to the front post there. You stop stand still because that gives you space when you're in the box for you to get your finishing. I'm going to listen to all that. But now I'm going to listen to you tell a great manager, in my opinion, too cool. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You're going to tell him how to manage. And the reason was you can't manage like that, as they said, was what are the other players thinking? Mm -hmm. Well, I'll tell you what I'd have been thinking. I'd have been thinking <laughs> that could have been me. Mm. Yeah. So, uh, it, what I'm trying to say is, the manager, although they get paid a lot of money, the managers only any power they've got these days is selection, the bench, and the substitutions. That's their main power. The days have gone of Keith Birkinshaw ruling the roost, Bill Nicholson ruling the roost at Tottenham, Alex Ferguson ruling the roost, Wenger ruling Wenger. the roost. Yeah. You are now a bit part actor. And you look after that bit there. It's a very important bit, by the way, the results. You look after that bit and we'll do all the other. Well, sometimes they interlock, don't they? That The way that players are treated off the field, etc. Promises are kept and all that stuff. So um, I, I think that's a, an age gone. The building. Yeah, yeah, of course, the other, thing, the other thing about it, Steve, was that managers in, in, in the days that we were talking about before, used to have extended periods. I mean, they'd be there for donkey's years as the manager. Now, you know, you upset Abramovich and don't win five games in a row and you're, you're likely to be toast. And yeah. I think this well, is this is the, the fundamental shift in the game that people yeah. aren't allowed to build something from whatever it is that, that, that they, they inherit. It's, it's well, just, I was, it's, I was it's, talking to Keith Birkinshaw this morning and I was asking him about Roger Hunt and... Um, Actually, Keith didn't play with Roger Hunt. Keith was at Liverpool. Not many people know that. But um, so he couldn't really help me on the Roger Hunt one. But, you know, he, he's, he's asking me about Nuno and he said, is, is he big enough to handle the job, Steve? And I said, Keith, with respect, people could have asked that question of you. Mm. Yeah. It's your first job as a manager. And by the way, we got relegated in your first year. And unbelievably, you kept your job. And eventually, as you promised me on a number of occasions, Steve, I'm going to build a team here. You did exactly that. And therefore, the early 80s was like a purple patch for the club. Um, never reaching the heights of Bill's team, but sort of pushing on and being a, 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 a respected member of the, you know, the, 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 the top league. So, um, yeah... It, it, Time, how long did Shankly take to win a trophy? Uh, Alex Ferguson struggled yeah. early days. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, if, if you appoint the right man, why why wouldn't you stick with him? Well, you've got I, an exact... Sorry, Steve, go on. I, I suppose with the, the, the world opening up to us, there's more choices to who to go and get when you sack a manager. Yeah. But Whereas, we've got an example... We've got an example now at Tottenham where somebody's been judged after five or six games. Arteta was the same at Arsenal. Then suddenly after three games, he supposedly turned it round. It is it is black and white, isn't it? There's no grey areas in football at the moment. Sure. Well, the, the people making those comments have to listen to themselves because three games ago, Arteta yeah. was not got hope in hell, was he? And now all of a sudden on the North London, a great, a great victory for that club, by the way. But he is now like walking tall again. Yeah. And, you know, I've heard all sorts of things on the radio about, about Arteta. He was a bulls, bibs and cones man for, for Pep. This was a, a lady international that was spouting off these things. And, and we all know, we all know about assistant managers. When you're left out, they just come and pacify you and tell you that they would have picked the particular player. And I'm mm. thinking, who have, who have you had as assistant manager? That that's, do you think Pep is going to employ a joke 
Is that what you're telling me? No, no. no absolutely not. So give them, give them a bit more time than what they're used to these days. And let's, let's see what everyone's got. I mean, in, in, in a way, considering he was, he was kind of a, dare one say, a doer Yorkshireman, Keith Birkinshaw turned into a visionary. I mean, Osvaldo Ardiles and, mm. and Ricardo Villa arriving at Spurs. The same with Bobby Robson at Ipswich bringing the Dutch players in. I mean, this was transformational stuff, wasn't it, as far as the, the English Very game was so. concerned? Very much so. I mean, um, a lot of it was money-driven because the sort of money being asked for third division players then was such that Keith could get these two Argentinians for very similar money. Yeah. There's a, I know there's a risk attached to bringing Argentinians over, but, you know, if you've got the right backup behind you, um, you know, office-wise, people to deal with, you know, pick them up, drop them off and sort out the house and all the bit, as long as you've got that structure behind you, then as long as they can play and, of course, there's a culture shock, but um, you know, not only did we sign two very, very good footballers, one well, one great footballer and one a very good footballer, um, then um, but they were they were terrific people. And I think that's where the luck comes in. You know, you can look into someone's character, but probably Keith had about three or four days in Argentina at the World Cup watching games. Who's he going to ask and understand about Ozzy and Ricky's character? Hmm. You're, you're sort of taking a punt, aren't you? And it was a punt that worked out. And and uh, two wonderful signings. You mentioned the two Dutchmen. What great players they were, by the way. Yeah. Yes. Wow. Uh, Mjorden and Cyprus. Wow, what players. So, you know, they all bring a different spice to your game, don't they? And... The fact that it wasn't so, <laughs> there weren't many people doing it. it we, we were we were looking deep at the spice that they were bringing into our mix, and you know they 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 all gave a great account of themselves. And and I suppose later on, we they were playing at a World Cup level, weren't they? Those four players, not necessarily Ricky, because we didn't see so much of him in the '78 World Cup, but but at least he was there. Um, you know, of late, we're signing people that. Not, yeah, internationals, but not necessarily um, world renowned or anything like that, are they? No, I mean Ricky obviously will go down in Tottenham folklore for the that winner in the nineteen eighty one FA Cup final. I mean that was yeah. what, what a goal that was, Steve. Well, Ricky, Ricky tells me the story. I was asking him one day about his. Um, about his upbringing and his school and stuff like that. Ricky lived on a ranch and um, got to a certain age where he had to travel a bigger distance to go to the next level of school. And he said, Steve, I, I had to, I rode a horse to school. <laughs> wow. Okay. He said, the only football that I played was on the farm with a ball, me, and I used to run in and out of the trees and back again. And that's what I would do, in and out of the trees and back again. I then go to the bigger school, and he said, I didn't play 11 v 11 till I was 13. And then the teacher is on the touchline screaming, Ricky, pass! Ricky, pass it! Ricky, pass it! I'm thinking... What's this pass? <laughs> so, so when he scored that goal, he was returning <laughs> back to his childhood of running in and out the trees. Out the trees, yeah, exactly. And one of the trees he had to beat for that famous <laughs> goal was Garth Crooks. <laughs> when you watch it again, when you watch it again, when, when Ricky picks the ball up, Garth Crooks yeah. is stood on the edge of the box, and now Ricky's running towards him, and. You would like to think that a front man with your player running towards you is going to spin left or right and hope for him to play a ball through to you. Well, Garth did this. He pirouetted <laughs> on the edge of the box. So Ricky had to beat him, beat, beat Garth's marker, and eventually ended up where we're all screaming inside our own heads, if not sort of verbally, shoot, shoot, shoot. <laughs> and, he, and, he, and he got he back. Shot. 
Yeah. But yeah. I'm thinking, I'm thinking back to Roger Hunt now. You know, mm-hmm. Greavesy had the the, the goal scoring mantle on him, didn't he? Jeff Hurst having right. scored three goals. Gordon Banks with a save uh, from Pele in later years, I know, but but world class goalkeeper. Ray Wilson was rated as a world class left back. I never hear much said about George Cohen. Mm. And the other one is Roger Hunt. There's no tag been attached to them. You know, even Nobby Styles that was jogging about Wembley with his teeth out. <laughs> Alan Ball, fiery redhead and, you know, running around and, you know, got a voice that helps you remember him. Of course, he was a great player. Of course he was. But Roger Hunt was sort of too normal. Mm. Yeah. Well, Ricky, by scoring that goal, Ricky... Yeah. Ricky's not known in Argentina now. They forget you very quickly. As soon as he flies into Heathrow and get and walks down the plane, people <laughs> going, Ricky, all right, Rick. Great. That's how that's how that's how the 81 victory and the goal that, that gave us the victory, that's the effect it had on people. If you were 10 years of age watching the English Cup final in Sweden, Norway, Denmark, Finland, wherever. You were probably going to be a Spurs supporter after that night. Yeah, I mean, sadly, sadly, there, sorry, sorry, Rick, go I was ahead. just going to just let's finish off on the Aussie and, and Ricky. Obviously, the Falklands War intervened, Steve. I mean, c- can you give us an insight into the dressing room when that sort of happened? And because I don't think um, they wanted to play, did they? So, I'm we're staying in the Belfry. Night yep. before the semi final against Leicester, mm. I think. And uh, I can keep, keep hearing this noise, which when we all wake up in the morning, is Ozzy and Ricky on the phone to their families with the family reporting backwards and forth about what's happening with the war. Mm. And um, so they obviously didn't get much sleep that night. And went out and we won the game. I think I think Leicester City played very poorly on the day. And um, I think we got an, an own goal to help us along. But um but Ozzy sat with me in the bath after he said, Steve, um I uh, I won't be playing in this final. Ah, okay. That, that, that's a bit of a statement, Oz. You know, you you had Ozzy's dream last year and yeah. You reacted so well to it. Um, this is because of the situation, the politics. He said, "Yeah." He said, "I'm gonna, I'm gonna leave. Uh, I might be, end up in France or somewhere." But um, and you are, you are gonna read all sorts of nonsense about Aussie Ardelis said this and Aussie Ardelis said that, and it, all type of propaganda. And I'm telling you, I'm not speaking to anyone. Not anyone. I. I love the English. I, of course, love my own country. The fact that these two people are going to be at war, imagine what's happening inside my head. And that's what he did. He didn't play in the final, did he? Um, no. I don't think Ricky, Ricky didn't play. Rick, Ricky, Ricky didn't play either. No. So so that's what effects, you know, off the field events can have on your life and on your career. And, you know, when people talk about how many trophies you won or didn't win, I mean, that's all part of it, isn't it? What's what's yeah. happening behind you? What's the story going on behind you? So, so yeah. But but we, we treated them exactly the same while Ozzy was there. Ricky stayed. I mean, for instance, a, a story got in the newspaper that uh, Ricky, who stayed in England, was so badly treated by these English, mm. not pigs, but horrible yeah. people his wife delivered her child on the back seat of a taxi wow. newborn well mm. of course that's that's not right that's nonsense right. but yeah. uh, that's that's the sort of thing you get involved in when you're talking wars mm. Mm. We, we we all we all want honesty in football and just going back to roger hunt just for a second steve it was interesting i read a piece i read something this morning about roger that because he was the guy who turned away when Jeff Hurst's shot in the final hit the underside of the bar and came down and said the ball was over the line, everybody England in the England team believed it because it was Roger, because he was basically an honest, straightforward, humble guy who would never say anything bad. So yeah. 
they all they all believed it was definitely over the line because if Roger hadn't said it was, then it probably wasn't. Sure, I I, I can understand that. Um, I suppose it it's it's about how far you would go to sort of cheat mm. to get a result. Yeah, and there's no bigger game in the world than the World Cup final, is there? No. And what it, we know what it meant to our country to to get it um and not happened since by the way but but um i i think it does come down to 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 judgments like that well that was roger's that was roger's reaction and so surely he would have chased it in if it yeah. weren't he, he would have he would have had a forward movement um i spoke to a chap again trying to find out some info about about roger and I spoke to a chap who organised the sort of 66 teams sort of theatre tour some years ago, and I think there was about seven or eight players. And um, they each player was going to talk for five minutes. Jimmy was leading it with this other gentleman. And, um, and so players spoke for five minutes each. But on asking them before the show, Ray Wilson said, I don't want to speak. I'm not happy to speak. And Roger Hunt said, "Me too. I'm, I'm, I'm okay. Not speaking. Anyway, so it's coming to a finish um, because uh, Jimmy is one of the two presenters. He spoke for about fifteen minutes, and being Jimmy and his humour, his humour and everything, as far as Jimmy was concerned, he sort of give everyone stick, everyone, including the other presenter. And the other man is now winding it up, and." At the top of his shoulder, Roger said, uh, I want the mic. Okay, so, uh, yeah, uh, Roger, who actually didn't want to speak before, so I haven't left him out, um, he now wants to say some words. So the great Roger Hunt. So Roger said, I think we should all remember that the very best goal scorer of all time, better than me, hope you don't mind, Jeff, better than you, He's on this stage and he did not win the World Cup. And I think we just need to remind ourselves of that fact. Well, our Jimmy must have thought on the back of that with this gentleman who didn't want to talk. Humble, yeah. great, lovely man. All the Liverpool supporters called him Sir Roger after the World Cup, apparently. Yeah. And they thought that he should have been made a Sir. And that's really what I like about Liverpool people. Um, you know, they back their own. They back their own, support their own people, and their own men, their own team. And if you do it for them, they do it back for you. And, and Roger, Roger Hunt certainly did it for them. Someone told me that he scored in, in, so a little bit different to Jim because he scored some goals in the second division. The year they got promoted, he scored 41 goals in 41 games. Oh, fantastic. Yes, I suggest that's a very <laughs> big reason why they got promoted. Yeah. yeah, brilliant. Yeah, was that the toughest of grounds to play at for an opposing player? Anfield, well, someone who lost 7 0 there. Um, yeah, I, mean, I don't know. Um, yeah. Yeah. I watched I that one. <laughs> yeah. Do you remember that last goal, Terry McDermott? From Heather. that end to that end, took about yeah. four seconds. I know. Well, they, they I did say. <laughs> They must, sorry. Running, they must have been running on lager fuel. <laughs> well, yeah, absolutely. Well, I, I did Terry McDermott's book with him and uh, obviously refers to that goal. And he says that he was on the post because it was a corner for you, wasn't it? A, a corner yeah. for Tottenham. Yeah. He was on the post talking to one of the other lads saying, where are we going out tonight? You know, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> suddenly, <laughs> suddenly Clem gets the ball, didn't he? Throws it and Terry, Terry bombs yeah. off to the other end and... Across from Steve Highway, header yeah. seven nil. So, well, sorry to mention, no, 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 no. Where I were mean, you at the time, Steve? <laughs> exactly, exactly. Right. I was trying to help make it six one, and it cost us seven nil. But uh, we were we were um, on the bus going home. You can imagine the mood on the bus. Ozzy and Ricky have sort of not been long joined us. They both got a World Cup winner's medal, as Ozzy used to sort of show us now and again. <laughs> and I'm set on a table of four, the three of us. And Ozzy can see that I'm down. And we probably got 
some supporter coaches driving past us as well. We're not going to be too happy. And Ozzy said in a caring way, uh, Stevie, no, no problem. No problem. What? No, you know, no, 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 no problem. No problem. I said, Ozzy, we're playing next Wednesday against whoever at home. When we run out that tunnel, they are going to take our fucking heads off. <laughs> so I suggest that is a problem. And Ozzy said, Stevie, no problem. I tell you why. Drugs. This team is on drugs. <laughs> <laughs> you could only be as good as they were on that day, according to Aussie Ardiles, because they were on drugs. Well, oh, when you think back to that World Cup and they had to beat someone by six clear goals, mm -hmm. was it Chile or someone? I don't know. Maybe, maybe there was a bit of, bit of drugs yes. involved in that one. But anyway. <laughs> But I loved, I loved playing at Liverpool. I loved it. I, I was a player who was better off against the odds. Mm. If my team was playing as we could, as we had our sort of purple patch moments, Glenn to Aussie, to this, to that, and the, Tony Galvin crossing the ball, Garth, and it, whatever, um, I probably weren't too involved. When it come to us being 2 nil down somewhere or... A fight on our hands, that's when Steve Perriman come to the front, which is, I suppose, a captain-type leadership sort of situation. So it was game on. It was game on every single time you went there. And, and you know the, the story about the Titanic, how long it took us to win a game at Liverpool. <laughs> it was the year that the Titanic sank. Anyway, so... Um, yeah, so my my third game of all time in amongst those 866 you mentioned earlier uh, was at Liverpool away. And Roger Hunt obviously would have played. That was St. John, Hunt, Yates, Tommy Smith, Lawler, Byrne, Tommy Lawrence in goal, etc. We drew nil-nil. Hell of a game. Hell of a game. And uh, Bill Nick... Uh, Bill Nicholson told me after, and remember, Bill Nick doesn't give you praise. Bill Nick said to me after, uh, Bill Shank, we mentioned you after the game. Oh. Okay. I, he said, Bill, where'd you get the tiger? <laughs> <laughs> what? Doesn't what, come much better than that, does it? That, that that is is what an accolade that is. Yeah. What an accolade. Yeah. So, anyway, the last five minutes, Jimmy Greaves got in from the halfway line. The problem was he didn't have to beat anyone. If he had to beat three, he'd have scored. The fact he didn't have to beat anyone, he's now 1v1 against Tommy Lawrence. What was Tommy Lawrence's nickname? The Flying Pig. The Flying Pig. <laughs> anyway, that sounds a bit disrespectful, but I'm sure it was done in a, in a respectful way. And, um, anyway, Jimmy, as ever... Just scrape the outside of the post. He could have stopped about another 50 years of agony for all us Spurs people if that had gone in, if that had crept in, you know, but not to be. Not to be. Amazingly, Steve, I, I mean, Neil will agree with me here. You've got one single England cap, which is ridiculous. I mean, I think you got the cap shortly after you won Football of the Year. You'd, you'd also won the FA Cup. I yeah. mean, that, that, does, that, does, that, does that grate a little bit? That in general, no. In general, no. But the way it happened was not quite right. So uh, Ron Greenwood's on the top table of the football writers do, yeah. and he said to me during the evening, "Steve, I'm going to give you a cap." Really? Yeah. <laughs> this remember this is eighty two. He said, "You're not yeah. going to the World Cup." But I've got to pick two squads, one to Finland, one to Iceland. And you'll do me a favour of being in the 40 that I announce. And um, we're going to get, get you on the field and get you a cap. So I've been voted by the, by, yeah. by the football writers. I mean, this is, a, this is a great night. When you look at those list of other people that have been voted that, 
it, it, they weren't normally my type of player. Mm. Anyway, so this is a Thursday night before the Saturday we play at Wembley again after the Man City won the year before. We're now playing QPR. We're all staying in a hotel. I think we stayed in a hotel for a week and I'm going to have to get out of there and get back to the hotel. And this, this is dreamland. This, I'm, I'm on fire. And, oh. and the England manager, who I turned down as West Ham manager to join his club um, that produced... Peter's Hurst and more, by the way. So that was yeah. a decision not to go there. <laughs> um, and by the way, Tottenham weren't producing players at that time. So even even more of a decision. So, um, but but again, as we dis discussed, Bill Nich I signed for Tottenham because of Bill Nicholson. Mm. So I, I end up being in the office and Glenn's at the letters part and opening his FA announcement that is in the squad it's already been announced in the paper and i'm in the squad but i haven't got a letter so mrs wallace the nice lady in the office said i'll phone the fa so she said uh steve perman's not got a letter he's in the squad but he hasn't ah we forgot <laughs> okay so just link into glenn's letter and fine okay lovely so the, the cup final's now been won, replays uh, drew, then won, and uh, we meet up in the West Lodge Park or wherever it was. First one to meet me was uh, Ron Greenwood, who said, sorry about the letter, Steve. Okay, no problem. He said, tonight we are going to the, I'm taking the whole squad to Cambridge United. They've got a, an orchestra on the pitch. And they're going to raise money. And I've said that I'm going to bring all the squad there to sign autographs as part of boosting the crowd, like a, a, for charity. But you don't have to go. Well, what else am I going to do, Ron, if I don't go? Oh, if, if you want to go, you're welcome. Please come. You're welcome. Okay, so I go. We have a nice evening. I'm thinking, no letter. Don't, you don't have to come. <laughs> So when we get back to the hotel after, we've had a nice evening, um, report to this room that we told the two squads, and I'm obviously going with a second squad, why wouldn't it be? And I'm going to Iceland, and it's going to be led by uh, Bobby Robson. Bobby Robson later called me in his book, The Baby-Faced Assassin, and he felt that I had something against Ipswich. Well... Maybe I did because I thought the Ipswich players, as good as they were, there was a number of them that were too flash for their own good. So if it, if I needed any impetus to sort of start challenging and tackling, yeah, that would be against Gates. Great player, by the way. Mariner, very good player, by the way. But all a little bit sort of yeah. airy-fairy-ish within their ability, of course. So, um, so... Lots of things went on during those three days. Bobby Robson hardly spoke to me. Eventually, the game is on. There's about 75 minutes gone. I've warmed up at least three times. He looks down the line. He says, Perry. Uh, Stevens. Steve Perryman, Bob. Yeah, sorry, Steve. Get warmed up. One more time. I said, I swear to you, I said, Bob, I'm fucking boiling. <laughs> oh, he God. said, he said, one more time. All right. So, uh, so I thought at the end of it all, I should not have accepted that cap. I should not have. I'm sure it was meant for the right reason. It was like, the, the reason the reason I feel that I weren't picked for England and and it was no hardship for me to stay at home and and train with five or six players because all the rest were off playing somewhere. It was sort of a rest for us. Um, I thought my the the purple patch of my career as a as a player was in the struggling times, like I just told you. I was mm. better in a struggle. And, you know, we got relegated and we came up again. We still weren't the article. Um, and 
because I was prepared to change positions, um, I think I was rated by the, the by the judges as a, um, a, a jack of all trades but master of none. I think that's how I was looked upon. I think if you was a Spurs supporter watching every game, you wouldn't think that. Mm. But, you know, when you watch someone four or five times and a bit on television, I think it, it's it's not so out of way to to have thought that. So, so anyway, it is what it is. I was so proud to be a Tottenham Hotspur player. Um, that as as good as it would be, and I was so happy for Glenn Hoddle and and people like that. Didn't he didn't he deserve to get picked in his time? Um, that that it's almost that was for other people. Mm. I, I never part of my strength has been that I never really rated myself. So to not get picked for England, not rating yourself, is not so much of a surprise, is it? But so. You were you not called up again? Were you not called up again? You're not named in any other squad, Steve, after that? No, no. I think I think when I said to Bobby, <laughs> I'm yes. fucking boiling. <laughs> Might have been a, a I, think, <laughs> I think that gave a big underline. And um, when did Bobby become the manager? Was it after that World Cup, 82 in Spain? No, Probably was. A bit later, wasn't it? But anyway, yeah, yeah. Well, he did become manager, obviously. Yeah. yeah. So, so yeah, I think that that sort of helped it. But, uh, but yeah. So, it, it's a very good story by me. But yet, yeah, it's not a story. And uh, yeah. I mean, cle clearly, at the end, at the end of sorry, your sorry, time, sorry, sorry, sorry. The last, the last instruction before we put me on. He put his oh, arm yeah. around my shoulder like he's my mate, and he says, Steve. I want you to man to man mark the blonde one. They're all blonde, aren't they? Oh, they're all fucking blonde. <laughs> <laughs> you couldn't write it, but I did write it in my book. But obviously upset him, and therefore I was I was oh, and he called me back the baby faced assassin. So yeah. I, I was I was gonna say you, you obviously your, your playing career ended, and and you you embarked on on, on management, Steve. Um, yeah. What what was your modus operandi as a manager? How did you approach it, and and and, and how did you enjoy the 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 process of, of management? Yeah, I loved it. Um, I think the 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 midway point of being a manager is being a captain, not the type of captain who you know just wears an armband and tosses up every game that that is a captain of course but i i was a, allowed the right under keith birkinshaw to to be part of the decision making i i even told him not to pick ricky for the replay 81 all right so go on so, <laughs> so keith asked me in the dressing room after the game um having taken ricky off ricky went Around the dog track, head bowed. Yeah. Um, would you would you pick Ricky for second game? Not a chance, Keith. Not a chance. In my eyes, he, he left the team to it. Anyway, so he said, I think he asked me the question to actually tell me that he was gonna pick him. So he said, I tell you, he's playing on Thursday. So I said, Great, Keith, that's why you're the manager. What I stress now is go and tell him now because he's so disappointed, try and lift him a bit out of that disappointment and let him look forward into Thursday. So I think I played my part in mm. in it working out, if you know what I mean. But yeah. me personally at that time, which said something about my naivety of leadership, I, I would not have picked him at that moment after that game when we got out of jail, luckily, didn't we, with an own goal. Anyway, so um, uh, I loved... I love the thought of trying to improve players. That's really what I stand for. I, I was, I was good at knowing why I was a certain player, and I, I believe that a lot of player, even some of the ones I played with at Spurs, had not worked out their game yet, and therefore it's the job of the staff, plus me in that area of Tottenham to help them sort of formulate their game. You know, 
helping later on at Exeter as director of football, you know, we'd have all sorts of trialists in the office and people that this is the last chance saloon. They've been to 16 clubs already and this is their last chance, 31 years of age. And, and Paul Tisdow, the, the latest of the last three managers that I helped there, um, would say to him, how do you score your goals? Uh, well, uh, well, I, I don't really know. <laughs> well, well, I've seen your last fifty goals on video. You score with your head. <laughs> you never score from this. You never score from that. And you might get a tap in now and again off the goalkeeper, but not enough. And but as simple as that seems, players. I always say this to Mickey Hazard. Mickey Hazard was a great, great, great talent. Great talent. He could twist and turn on the ball as good as any, you know, I'm thinking back of uh, Muren and Tyson now, that sort of turn away from you. And Mickey, Mickey would have been as good a player as he was. He would have been a great player if he could have transferred one performance into the next. I do that well. I don't do that quite so well. I shouldn't really be doing that again, which is how you become experienced and consistent within that experience. Every game to Mickey Hazard was a new game. And it was virtually like, how am I going to play today? Mm. I said to him one day, Mick, give us a clue, will you? How do you know what happens before a game for you to know this is my day? This is, this is a good day for me. Well, uh, if there's a good song playing over the loudspeaker as we're warming up, I think, yeah, this is me today. I said, well, that's great, Mick, but you can't control what the, <laughs> what the DJ is going to play on the bloody pitch. So we've got to <laughs> think of something else for you. So, yeah. So when I went into management uh, at the lower leagues, Brentford was third division. You're going to have, do you know, Brentford had five practice balls when I took over, five training balls. And the chairman said to me after about two or three days extra, we never produce players at Brentford. Why don't we produce players? Which was not obviously a dig at me. I've only been in it three days. So I said, do you know how many balls you had when I took over? What? I said you had five practice balls. Oh, it's not my fault. That's that's the uh, that's the previous manager's fault. Well, I said I, I, I bear that one in mind when I'm looking to spend some money on improving your players, whether you give a yes or no or a maybe to my request. It was like it was like getting blood out of a stone, and we're not producing players. How do you think you? How do you think you improve players if you've got five poxy balls? So there, there's, you know, having been at Tottenham, I suppose I could be a bit of a snob as such with training kit being washed for you and put out and everything, everything sort of done for you. But I obviously realised that couldn't happen at a Brentford. But I want to try and make it as good as I can for the players. I want to help them as much as I can to improve. And someone like Andy Sinton, the chairman told me after about a week, get rid of that fat ass little waster. Who's that? Andy Sinton. So he'd paid 25 grand for, from Cambridge United as a 17 year old. And now he was about 18 months down the line. So he said, I said, whoa, whoa hold on a minute. Whoa. Let me have a bit more of a look at him before I start telling you who, who we are going to get rid of. Andy Sinton wanted to improve every single day of his life. Every single day of training, he'd come to me and say, Steve, can we do a bit more? Can I work on this? Can I? What do you think I need with, with regard to my crossing? And guess what? We sold him in the end that the chairman was delighted about being tight as a brush sold it for 350 grand or whatever to QPR, but he wanted him out the door. So, so you have to, you have to believe in yourself, believe in the ability for players to improve. Some listen, some don't, 
You have to learn very quickly about that. Can you change them? I'd like to think I can change people. I really thought I could change that Brentford manager, uh, chairman. Mm. Couldn't. Absolutely couldn't. So, um, yeah, of course you can go out and spend money. If you haven't got money, you can't spend it. So you've got to improve what you've got. And young players at Tottenham would tell you, Gary Brook, Mickey Hazard, Ian Crook, Richard Cook, young players at Tottenham will tell you that when they played with me, they didn't often get in, but when they played with me behind them, sat right back and Richard Cook's a right winger and Brooks is a right winger, and wide midfielder, not winger. Um, they said that I made their game easier because I could tell them where they should be. If I'm going in here on the cover, Brooksy in there. Brooksy, another 10 yards. Do you know what I mean? So you, you're sort of playing the game from, and that's what you have to do as a manager. You have to... When they go onto the pitch, of course, they're their own men, but the, it, it, it's, all, it's all about what you're giving them in the week, how, how your honest communication and a belief in that they can improve. And I suppose there was a bit of Bill Nicholson in me that would try to tell them the truth as against fannying them along. And uh, I, I think there's a need for that. We, you know, when Tuchel said, I took him off because didn't like his body language, didn't like this, I didn't like that. That's a bit of Bill Nick, that. That's from a past era. And non-managers are telling you he can't manage like that. Mm. I, th I think he can. Mm. I think you have to. So um, I, probably, I probably didn't achieve what I should have done as a manager um, although I, when, when me and Ozzy got the sack from Sugar, and I don't see that as a negative in any way, getting the sack from someone like him because he didn't really know what he was doing football-wise. But we ended up in Japan together, and Ozzy got manager of the year. I got manager of the year two years later after he left. We won trophies together. We won trophies individually. When I left Japan and Ozzy eventually came back. So you just... Um, I, I never really got on with the non-opinion, the non-football opinion surrounding you as a manager. I couldn't accept someone wanting to tell you that left back is better than that right back when you're doing the retained list. But by someone, do you, do you mean a, a board member or a fan yeah. or a you journalist? A or... Always, always the chairman, always the ego chairman owner. Right. And... Um, the best, the best chairman I ever worked for was uh, Eddie, and uh, not Eddie Plumley. He was the secretary, Jack Petty at Watford. Yeah. Jack Petty was an absolute dream. Everyone thinks he was tough and hard, and this and that and the other. As long as you, he gave you the budget. As long as you stuck to the budget, and you kept him in touch with what was happening, what was changing, what phone calls happened, etc. Why you were making certain decisions. He was fine. I said to Sugar one day, you think you're tough? You think you're tough? Jack Petty is about 300 times tougher than you. And he ain't ever going to, well, now I'm saying it, it Jack Petty ain't ever going to be on a TV program telling people how tough he is. So Jack Petty said to me one day, I, as manager of Watford, we had one day a month. In the morning would be Eddie Plumley, the secretary. In the afternoon would be me, the manager. Jack had about 20... 30 uh, companies he was involved with. So all, all the decision makers of each company had that sort of one day or half a day like we had. He said to me, and everything was minuted, everything was sent you the next day. You had to answer those minutes so many working hours before your next month's appointment. You were given those appointments a year in advance so, of course, if there's a cup replay, that would be off, that month's talk. Um, but you wouldn't decide to take your wife out for a meal on one of those days that you're supposed to be with Jack Petty. You, you wouldn't put, you'd pri prioritise what you put in front of it. So if it's a football thing, of course it happens. So within these questions that he asked you in, in these meetings, in his office, he, he said, Steve, do you remember what we agreed when you when you signed up for here, I said, yeah. 
he said, you can't spend anything before you've bought it in. Exactly, yeah. I, I remember that. I'm never going to forget that, Jack. I know you put it in the minutes, but I'm never going to forget it because I know you won't forget it. But you better know that I won't forget it either. Anyway, so he said, so if you had half a million pounds to spend tomorrow, give me a list of the number nines that you'd sign. So what, he, what, he, what he's trying to do is prepare you for the next signing when you get money. And eventually we sold David James to Watford. Well, guess what? If I want to centre forward, he better be one of them number nines I put on that list <laughs> about six months earlier. But, but that's what you want out of a chairman, not to tell you who to do. I suppose in a way he wanted you to, to act businesslike, similar to him. But he had a business way and you've got a football way. And if you marry the two up, you've got a chance. So, yeah, I, I love working for Jack. The, the, the decision I made to leave him to go and join Aussie as, as his assistant at Sugar's Tottenham Hotspur was the worst decision I'm ever going to make in my life. <laughs> and, and, and yet we ended up in Japan together and had three of the best years of our lives three of the very best years of our lives, bearing in mind he's a World Cup winner and we've agreed it. Best, we had respect, we were listened to, the players wanted to work, you had to tell the players to go home. No, that's enough, home. That's enough, now, home. They just wanted more and more and more what was in your head. So the, the perfect place to work and... Uh, so I suppose if I didn't uh, hadn't joined Aussie at Tottenham under Sugar, then um, were you in the group of press men who came out to see me having my team won the championship? I yeah. should have been, but I wasn't, Steve. No, no. There was, there was two reasons for the press corps to be there. On one Saturday, I can't imagine which one or remember which one was which, but one weekend was the World Cup draw. And the next weekend was Man United playing the champions of South America in the what was called the Japan Cup or something. Toyota Cup, maybe. And uh, my team won the championship on the Wednesday between those two events. So all the press corps were there. Right. And therefore, they, I had a phone call. Can we come down and see you? Yeah. Hour on the fast train from Tokyo. If you if you see Mount Fuji, that's where we live. That that sort of area, <laughs> and uh, and I gave them chapter and verse on uh, what happened with Ozzy and myself at Tottenham under Sugar, and as they're writing it down, they're looking at each other as though to say, "We can't write this. <laughs> it's to the arse of us. We cannot write it." <laughs> so some wrote ten percent of it. Some wrote maybe fifteen percent, but. It didn't quite get across what I was trying to say, but if you read between the lines, it did. Yeah. Yeah. Some 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 people, some man uh, some chairman, and remember all this is sort of ego driven with most chairmen. Some chairman would prefer to listen to the golf club barman. Yeah. Or Harry Harris. Huh. Yeah. And the manager they're paying wages to for his opinion. Yeah. Can you believe yeah. that in business? Can you believe that? Well, that my happened. Man. That happened with Mike Ashley at Newcastle. He listened to the the wrong men early on. You start listening to the wrong people, well, you're in trouble. Yeah. Suppose and having listened to them, they're right. What do you do next week? <laughs> <laughs> what do you do? The only one, the only one thing I, re, I I vividly remember Alan Sugar saying when we were in Geneva, I think for for a, a UEFA a UEFA convention or something, before before the the game was littered as it were with 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 foot with players from abroad, he he's famous. Remember he he came up with the name Carlos Kickerball. This yeah. game's going to be full of bleeding players called Carlos Kickerball before you know where you're going, and in a sense, mm. he's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, so, <laughs> and it's going to spot, and it's he, he, his his viewpoint was it was going to ruin the game. 
Ozzy, uh, Ozzy was in Ozzy was in Brazil trying to sign our day here. And my phone goes in the car, so I'm handling things while Ozzy's out there for a couple of days. Phone goes, and where's Ozzy? Hello, Mr. Sugar, how are you? Uh, that's what you get, a grunt. Uh, are we going to sign this effing Basil Bolly or not? Well, I know what you're talking about, but I think that's between you and the manager, and you know that Ozzy's in Brazil, so uh, I suggest you wait for him to come back. But you're obviously phoning me for a reason, because I think you want my opinion. Yeah. I said, we don't fancy him. Don't effing fancy him. My mates tell me he's the best effing centre-half in Europe, if not the effing world. I said, well, with respect, Mr Sugar, your mate's better Fucking sign him then. <laughs> <laughs> and down it goes. Oh dear. Yeah. Didn't okay. sign him. Didn't sign him, thankfully. And when we got the sack and when it ended up in Japan, so did he. He signed for a, a bigger club ever than we were. Having said that, we were champions, but that's another mm. thing. And uh, I think he lasted about six months in Japan. <laughs> yeah. yeah. No. Which I which is a which is a current breed of manager? Um, are you impressed by Steve? Um, I like the Brighton manager. Yep. Yeah. Uh, I like the way they play um, and decisions that have been made, obviously on on players. Um, uh, <laughs> I watched one game on television, and. They, one of the pundits in, back in the studio said, he's a good manager, this fellow, but I'll tell you what, he's got to learn. He's got to learn about uh, game management. Is that right? Anyway, I've got on my phone his record. His record, albeit at a low level in Sweden, he's been successful for about 10 seasons on the spin. Mm. He's probably been through the game management one, and out the other side and decided he don't need or he don't want his players to be positive, 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 get a goal up, whoa, go negative. Because then it's hard to get them out of that go negative one. Right. So, so again, a non-manager telling a manager what he should and shouldn't be doing. The game management one drives me insane, insane. However, how long was I with Bill Nick? Eight years. I never heard in eight years, run the ball to the corner flag, kick it over the stand, um, kick the life out of this fella because he's their best player. I've never heard any of that. And don't tell me Bill Nicholson wasn't a super, super, super professional manager because he was. So, I mean, as you say, Steve, these pundits can be very influential on club decisions, can't they? And uh, as you say, most of them have not gone into management. Well, there's one who was on Sky Sports who didn't do very well at Valencia, mm. you know, and, and and yet he's the uh, sort of king of the pundits, if you like. So yeah, it well, is more difficult for, for managers these days, isn't it? Well, I had an under-12s manager sat opposite me in this office where I am now, Um asking me some some training tips for his team and the local little village team and stuff. And I'm telling you, these people are influenced by what they hear and see on television. Of course you would be. I'm thinking I'm going to influence him across the table. Well, it's, it's on telly in front of him. I think the problem with game management is there's too many, too many hours being spent telling teaching players how not to play rather than how to play yeah. there's not enough hours in the day to teach them all the good things they are to be taught of how to play famous famous incident they uh ever and a player at man united man united winning three two the thing goes up four minutes after a minute man united put on a sub if he was injured, I wouldn't even be talk, telling this story, but he wasn't injured. Anyway, he walks off, he runs on. The first thing this sub does is give a foul away on the halfway line. 
the halfway line free kick goes in the box. The big striker of Everton on his chest. Goal. 3-3. Three, three. Not one of them says that game management don't always work, does it? Because <laughs> it don't always work. Uh, if you don't talk about it, it's like the professional foul. All they do is smile about it. Mm. Like, yeah. well, look, the moment a player gets hit with a professional foul and it finishes career, they will all go ape shit. It hasn't yet finished the player's career, or not that I know of. Mm. It's not a professional foul. It's a non-professional foul. Be good enough to defend. Be good enough to cover each other. I know I'm I'm looking for perfection here, but trust your goalkeeper. Trust your goalkeeper. You've made a mistake. The, the, the opponent's got away from you. What gives you the right just to kick him down from behind? Is this an entertainment or not? Because mm. I think it is. So I know <laughs> I'm very critical of the pundits. I I. In a way, I want them to think my way, and that's not going to happen. Um, I want them to talk about what they know about, not what they don't know about. And one of the things they don't know about is managing. And you can go on a coaching course, you can go on this course, whatever. Find me the coaching course that teaches coaches to tell players or to help players speak to other players, communicate with them, give them messages to each other turn, shoot, whatever. One of your questions I know that you were coming with for me, because you kindly sent them, was um, who had the most effect on you when you was yeah. a player? Okay, this is not a sexy answer, but it's my answer. My oldest brother is four years older than me, and apparently when I was five or six, following these two brothers around, over the field eventually to play football and I was spent more time playing with mud than actually playing and they would say get on off get out anyway so I'm now say 10 11 the oldest brother is say 15 not driving he would have to take me to play for the school on a bus from North Oak to Ealing Common it's about half hour and Going home on the bus, he would discuss with me one incident that happened in that game, be it a referee's decision, be it something I did, not necessarily, something my teammate did, and we would discuss that through. Even if, so this was giving me an opinion, even if I copied that opinion and it wasn't really mine, it gives me an opinion. Yep. Eventually, he says to me this nugget, right, this nugget. Steve, you will be a better player when you realise that if you tell the man on the ball what you think he should do with it, it makes you a better player, gives you an opinion. Not because you're a good player, not because he's a bad player, not because he's not a good a player as you. The reason being that none of us have got eyes in the back of our head. That was the biggest moment for me of the doors opening mm. to why I'm on yeah. that pitch in a team. Yeah. And I'd never, Bill Nicholson, Eddie Bailey, Keith Birkins, your Peter Shreves, whatever. I never remember a day like that with any of them, but obviously the teaching was going in. Drip, 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 whatever. That was the, my brother said to me, Steve, don't, please don't get upset if they don't listen to you because when you're in possession of the ball and you've turned, there's a hundred things going on in your mind or your vision or whatever. And sometimes they don't hear you, but still give the advice. That gave me a career. Of course I needed a touch and of course I needed a bit of heart and a bit of balls, of course. But that leadership situation gave me a career. Is that career now over, Steve? Do you still fancy? No, fancy? it's over. It's over. Definitely. Yeah, I ended up helping Exeter for a number yeah. of years. First four years unpaid because they didn't have any money. The last 13 years helping them to produce players like Ollie Watkins that they sold. 
Um, and now they're instead of being minus five million and going out of business, they're now sort of plus six or seven million and owned by the supporters. <laughs> but those people, those people, and they're not the same people, but say the football, it's owned by the supporters, the football trust, the Exeter Trust. When I started to help them, they would own up that we know nothing. We support this club, we turn up. But we sort of don't really know what we're watching and, you know, tell us. And sometimes I would say to them in those early days, you need, I know you haven't got any money because you're skint, but you need to spend some money on the training pitches. Yeah. Steve, yeah. Uh, they're green, aren't they? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. From, from this distance, they're green. <laughs> if you stand and look down. Anyway, by the end of my time there, uh, Exeter City, the supporters trust, new people coming in all the time because they wear you out. This this thing wears you out. And uh, in the end, those sort of people wanted to tell me who can play, who can't play, who should play, who shouldn't play. Right. That's, en that's enough. Yeah. I'm done. I'm done. As soon as it starts getting political, leave me out. I'm a football man. I'm a football judge. I, I can definitely help young players improve, even some old players I can help improve. And um, I can only do that when I've got a clear head and I'm not worried about you dickheads telling me who can play and who can't it, who can't play. So present company accepted. <laughs> <laughs> oh no, well, we've been called worse than that. <laughs> oh, sure. <laughs> mean, number one, have an opinion. That's fine. A absolutely yeah. fine. You, you, you know, you, I, I've been and talked to supporters groups with Tottenham, you know, ever since I've finished being a player. Right. And sometimes they would introduce me. And one guy said this day, uh, so over to Steve Perriman. And as he walked away, he said, perhaps Steve can tell me why Potch is picking fucking so-and-so, <laughs> so-and-so, whatever. And I said, well, what a start. <laughs> He picked so and so and so and so because he's the fucking manager. Mm. That's his right. That's what he does. That's how he earns his money. And if he don't do it well enough, someone gets rid of him. Mm. Do you want him to pick your team or my team or his team? Is that possible to pick all our teams? I don't think so. He can only pick his team. Got to. I, just say, I noticed our, our, our old mate Peter Taylor's just taken over at Welling United. Yes. In League South. Good luck. What, he, he can't get rid of the managerial bug. Can he? <laughs> He's, got the drug. He's got the drug inside him. And yeah. what a good man Peter is. What a good man. Yeah. Absolutely. And uh, uh, I, I used to room with him on um, on Friday nights. How and, do you ever get, how do you ever get to play on Saturday? You must have been in stitch, <laughs> stitches most of the time, I should imagine. Yeah. Um, Mr. Mr. Grimsdale. He used, to take off. Fail, yes. he used to take off normal wisdom, didn't he? he did, anyway, yeah. this one day he's been told at the end of training or during the training that he won't be playing at Leeds the next day. So all the way up on the bus, he sent me, he's out of order, he's not, you know, he's this he's not a good manager, this keep working sure. Da, 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 da. He's left me out, it's not fair. Da, da, da. And then have the evening meal with all the chaps, and then upstairs in the room, we're watching television, and he's still at it. And about half this is Peter's story, by the way, not mine. Mm. About half nine at night, I said, Pete, just fucking switch off, will you? He's right. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I didn't hear any more from him so, <laughs> so um, but I also used to say to him he'd be writing his team out on a, his Sunday team you know probably when I met you yeah. his Sunday, he'd write his Roach team way. out on a bit Roach of paper yeah. yeah he'd write his team out on a bit of paper and then he'd start phoning players up saying are you alright for Sunday and I want you to do a bit of this and a bit of that and I'd say Pete any chance we can get our game over with first? <laughs> Before you start putting your, your brain somewhere else. But I had him on my podcast the other day. And oh, great. You know, he managed Mancini. He managed the England manager. So the, yeah. two England, the two managers of the Euros, he managed both of those. He made Beckham captain yeah. in one game in charge of England. I mean... He worked for such different characters as Malcolm Allison there and Keith Birkinshaw there. 
Oh, yeah. Malcolm, yeah. Allison would call him, Malcolm Allison would call him into the office, tell him what a great player he was and how many offers he'd had for him, but you're not going, and give him 100 quid a week rise without it signing a new contract or anything, just, you know, giving you 100 quid. And Keith Birkinshaw would say to him, after having signed him from Palace, um, as an England international, by the way, after six weeks would say, I'm not sure you're going to suit us, Peter. <laughs> <laughs> Tell you what, as you say, two two ends of the same spectrum, huh? Absolutely. Yeah. But what you know, what great experiences these all are. To to, yeah. you know, we started with Jimmy Greaves and Roger Hunt against Roger and with Jimmy and wow, the characters you meet and and you know you travel the world and you you meet people that you want to spend the rest of your life with and you meet other people that you don't you know you don't care you never see them again, but. But, uh, hopefully, hopefully we're in the former category. Well, I've, I've really enjoyed talking to you. That's for sure. No, I know Steve, Mate. and we're we're yeah. delighted you've come on, and it's been it's been great as usual. I didn't expect anything else, to be perfectly honest. And you've always been a star. It's not, it's and, not what you said to me this morning. <laughs> <laughs> and where, uh, where are you absolutely both? Brilliant, absolutely brilliant, Steve. Sorry, where are you both? I'm on the uh, Sunday Mirror, Sunday People now. At and, where and, you live. I live in Cheshire, near Cheshire. Cheshire. And you're? Yeah. I'm in Wokingham in Berkshire. Yeah, Wokingham, yeah, of course, yeah. 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 Unemployed. <laughs> Only, uh, well, yes. In, in, enjoying semi-retirement, I think we'd, we'd probably be best to say. Brilliant. Good, hey, good Steve. stuff, good stuff Steve. Steve. Absolute and pleasure. Let's, Thank let's you very much. Stay in touch. And it's uh, been an absolute joy, as always. I I have, I, you can ask me what I'm up to now. I've written a book. It's been out for a couple of years, but so has COVID. It's yeah. called Spur Forever, and um, I think people will enjoy it. So that, there's my uh, there's my yeah. payment for today. Yeah, Good man. Yeah. Thanks a lot, Steve. Thanks, Steve. Take care of yourself. Cheers. Good luck, Cheers. Thank you. Cheers. Bye bye. Thanks a lot. Bye bye. bye. Thanks, Steve, for a brilliant hour and a bit. I would have said, and that's it for this Hang week. On. Let me let me remove myself from the stream, Rick, and then you can. Okay. Thanks, Steve, for a brilliant hour. Well, more than an hour. Absolutely enjoyed every minute of it. That's it for this week. The show was produced and edited by Sam Sethi. Come back to the old Spice Boys next time. Follow us in your podcast app, and we're online at www.oldspiceboys.football. We'll catch you again soon. Cool. Let me end that.